Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, the Friday edition, the raw, the more casual, sit-back, laid-back edition. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. Today's February 8th, 2019. You liking the new music? You know, that's why we want to change things I don't up. know. If it sounds yeah. like a home improvement show to it me. May, well, uh, it, you know, we had the the guitar, uh, the guitar riff that I wrote before that you heard. Um, now we're kind of just uh, picking the free music off of Google Play and seeing how that works because this is less copywritten. Well, we'll see what the audience thinks. We've got some good comments, and one person goes, "Go back," and you could tell he was a rocker. You know, go back. Don't don't do that. So, people, before we get started, we need you to. Oh, I got to go to the other page. Click on template and need you to like this program even before you watch it you should make a practice of just clicking the like button because sometimes we're going to say things that are more controversial or things you don't agree with and you may not like the program by the time you get to the end so we want you to to be progressive and hit it right away share the program uh one of the magic of this program is people love it but they don't tell anybody we need you to start telling people that you watch and love Anglican Unscripted. Comment. We get lots of comments in the comment section on YouTube. We really appreciate that. Some of you have not subscribed yet. We're almost to 4,000 subscribers. <sighs> Incredible, because we're going for a million. So if you haven't subscribed yet, you need to click that little button there. There's a, a little animation going on now how to do that. And for those of you who don't want to see us, on the screen, we have podcast. So you can download us, listen to us on the way to work, to church, uh, to whatever you do. How you been doing, George? I'm doing great. Just fantastic. Spring has arrived in Florida. Mm -hmm. It's in the 70s. The My car is covered every morning in yellow dust from the oak trees pollinating. It's pollen. Ugh, no way. Uh yeah, it's, Hummingbird, it's, hummingbirds are back. Uh, Susan's all excited because she put up a feeder, and this is the first year where there are actually hummingbirds feeding from her right. feeder uh, we, instead uh, we, of squirrels drinking the nectar or whatever it is. Yeah. Well, we finally hit rainy season here, so uh, we had like three days of rain. Joy, joy, joy. Uh, it looks like the first update we have is the Bruno update. Uh, Bishop Bruno, if you've been paying attention to the news for a long time, he is infamous for what uh, he's done to help facilitate the split in the Episcopal Church and the, um, the wars, the legal wars, and taking property that some people don't think belongs to him. And uh, recently, George, uh, there was actually action taken against him by the Episcopal Church. I thought we could give the update and then talk about uh, the den denial of the appeal here. Uh, Bishop, the Court of Appeal for the uh, trial of bishops upheld the conviction of Bishop Brewer for essentially misconduct. You said Brewer, it's Bruno. Oh, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry. <laughs> All these bees running through my head. Bishop John Bruno yeah. of Los Angeles was removed from, well, he was given basically a terminal suspension, meaning he was suspended from office, could not exercise Episcopal office until his announced retirement, and that has since come and gone. Um, now, he is still a member of the clergy. He not is defrocked. Not, not defrocked or deposed, right. but it upheld the sentence that he could not act episcopally. episcopally. Uh, Which clearly, and, he couldn't do it right the first time. So give us a quick update. How do we get here? How do we get here? This is a sad, sad story. And I'm a little per perturbed by some of the comment. Maybe it's just my temperament, but... You know, this is a man who did some very, I, I think, bad things in the way he treated uh, two very different converse congregations, both of whom were at uh, St. James in Newport yeah. Beach, the Ang what is now the Anglican Congregation what, and became the Episcopal Congregation. Uh, and he, Bishop Bruno, acted as, in a bullying fashion, and in a, a very imperious faction as the king bishop. And now he has been, basically has lost all that was important to him. And some people are being nasty about it. Um, and I, I, I have a great deal of sorrow for Bishop Bruno because he's, his, his ministry career has been a failure. Mm 
-hmm. if you look at him where he is right now he has he has alienated so many people he's been rejected by his own church and he and what he pursued was power and what he has now had this past week is a definite statement that you will never have any standing or power in the Episcopal Church ever again. I feel so, I feel badly for him for what he must be going through emotionally. Yeah, I mean, we need to look at him as a lost soul and somebody who um, needs through repentance to come back to the church, not as somebody we sit and denigate, uh, I not even say that right, uh, hate on and troll on on facebook and online um I, I, people are taking this in it in the wrong direction well it is you know facebook and social media does allow people to vent it allows you to have an anonymous name and say all sorts of nasty things about other people that you probably wouldn't say if they were in front of you i've been in front of john bruno i've had discussions with him i have had difficult uh, engagements with him in my career as a writer um, but he's still a man. He still needs the love of Jesus, and he still would benefit from compassion, uh, not uh, condemnation right now. So for our viewers, this is going to be a heavy tech show. We're going to talk a lot about the Episcopal Church because we talked a little bit about, about um, the March for Life and other things last week, and there was a, some of our viewers kind of misunderstood or didn't understand our interpretation of how the Episcopal Church power and legal structure works. A lot of people think, well, a lot of people think it's like the U.S. Constitution, the fair representation about um, it's not quite that way. It's kind of based on the, the Confederacy, if you want. We had a uh, very senior ACNA uh, bishop write to us and say, oh, you've got it all wrong about uh, the Episcopal Church and abortion, and he pointed to several general convention resolutions. And I gave a George answer, which is, yes, but. And the yes, but is, uh, we need to look at the principles of how the Episcopal Church works. No general convention can bind the next general convention unless it is a canonical or a constitutional change. How, but let's back up. What he said was correct. In his yes, response. yes, but his interpretation of what he said was right. incorrect. I agree with that. Okay, yes. The Episcopal Church speaks through one thing and one thing only, its Book of Common Prayer. I'll give you an analogy. We've had gay marriages for going on 30 years right now. It was not until the process, which is accelerating rapidly and is the whole bill of controversy, that the prayer book has been changed, that we can now say the Episcopal Church endorses, supports gay marriage. General conventions are a gathering of, of people. Misfits. At a certain... They're a gathering of misfits. Well, if you remember those kids at the Model UN in high school, uh, this is what they do as grown-ups. Yes. Um, how, how should I explain this to people? Kevin mentioned it's John Jay, one of the founding fathers who helped write the U.S. Constitution, was one of the people who helped write the Constitution of the Episcopal Church 200 odd years ago. And it was deliberately modeled not on the U.S. Constitution, but on a previous document, the Articles of Confederation. That is why our General Convention is organized the way it is. Uh, we have, if, if it were organized as a democratic or deliberative body, it would have, Texas would have 25 deputies and the Diocese of Western Kansas would have one. But no matter how big or small you are, you have same number of representation. The only time you don't is when you're too poor to send more, send all the people who want to go. And the, the, the diocese, unless it is put into the constitution and canons, basically can ignore at will. Many dioceses ignored it. Will the rules forbidding women clergy, and then the rules allowing women clergy? It was only in the Catherine Jeffrey Shorey days and with David Booth Beers that we had the lawlessness that became the Episcopal Church. So, what I need to press is that just because a group of Episcopalians support a certain issue, or a resolution is passed. Unless it does not speak for the Episcopal Church, only the Book of Common Prayer does. And we confuse the Episcopal Church with governments and we confuse it with the Catholic Church. We're closer to somebody like the Baptists in our polity 
on this particular area than we are to the Catholic Church, in my opinion. No, and I agree because we've seen how that works. Tomorrow, they could convene a general convention. The general convention could condemn and forbid gay same-sex marriage. Would yeah. that work? No. No. It wouldn't work because they don't have a bindingness to their uh, resolutions. All you have to do is refer to the prayer book for what the Episcopal Church believes. So <clears throat> so in, on the abortion issue, I think people should hear me. I am entirely in line with Kevin in my views on this issue. I'm entirely in line with the bishop who wrote to me. Where I differ is in my interpretation. Now, our, my conversation with the ACNA bishop went down to, he said, well, I wish you, hope you tell Bill Love this, the general conventions can't bind other general conventions. I said, yes, I have, and I believe he has a very strong legal case. He does, yeah. Should it, should it ever get there? Mm -hmm. But, you know, we live in a, a different age where integrity and honor and truth mean nothing within the Episcopal Church, and we may instead see the campaign that was waged against South Carolina and Fort Worth, where in essence, we're going to spend you into defeat, not address the merits of the issue. Well, we're now to the point where places like Albany, uh, Central Florida, and remaining conservative dioceses, which there's very few, have to consider replacement. Are replacement we going to, of, of, their, the bishop, of the when bishop. When our bishop retires, who's going to be allowed to replace him? Because we'll have lots of candidates who are conservative and, and will hold the orthodox line within... Uh, our belief system, but they'll never get past 815, they'll never get past uh, the, the structure of the Episcopal Church. Don't know. Uh, could, conceivably could be so. Uh, but we can't really tell. Um, we don't know. And actually, the, ba it, the fight is worth fighting. Uh, if you elect, if you elect someone uh, to Florida or Central Florida, or Southwest Florida, or Albany or Dallas, or, or North Dakota, uh, and so on, who doesn't uh, agree with the uh, marriage majority, but they say, "Yo, I'm still staying in and fighting the good fight to convince you that you're wrong." I very much doubt that he would be canned. Now, if it were me, I would be canned because because <laughs> yeah. uh, I've not, uh, because. Uh, you know, people have long memories. Long and I've memories said some and silly and thing. I've memory. never appeared in blackface, Kevin. I've not done that. But I'm for surprised. the Episcopal Church, I've done worse. Uh, I have criticized Catherine Jeffrey Shorey, pointing out her corruptions and her failings and her faults. And of course, she's the great saint of our times for so many people. I, I want to digress for a moment. I grew up at the same time period, the 80s, went to college in the 80s, that these gentlemen in Virginia did, who all wore blackface. I never wore blackface. I never went to a party where anybody was wearing blackface. Is it a Virginia thing? Is it, I, I just, I, I have to come out of the closet and tell people, I didn't wear blackface. Did you, I, you said you didn't. Uh, is it something just over on the, uh, the, the East Coast there? It's not an East Coast thing, Kevin. Uh, uh, I, I can't help you there because it's uh, it's a mystery to me where these things come from, uh, where some of these people, I, I don't know. I, don't I, know. Can't, help you. I can't help you. <laughs> that's right. I went way off topic. Uh, you asked an unepiscopal question. I can't. That's right. Okay. So, I mean, that's part of the trouble we have here is what the Episcopal Church does in its meetings and conferences are not always binding because they don't end up in the prayer book. And, right. and you can interpret I th I think, the, oops, sorry, go on. I, I think people should understand that um, there are many, many different Episcopal churches in people's understandings. And it comes back to our colonial heritage. I'm from Philadelphia originally. My family's from Philadelphia. Um, and I grew up in Philadelphia and in South Florida. And I grew up in a part of South Florida where most people were from Philadelphia. We are very different from New York. We're very different from New England. We're very different from the South. We're very different from Texas. Why? Well, the pit in the Philadelphia area was influenced heavily by the Quakers and the German pietists. We're not New Englanders where we would go out and fight for slavery and get involved in politics. The church in Philadelphia draws upon 
the German pietistic tradition of not getting involved in politics, that this is a terrible thing to do, it's betrayal of the gospel, which I fully believe. But that is the strand from which I came, where uh, you focus more on personal holiness than political progress. And each Episcopalian uh, essentially believes that theirs is the right way. Catherine Jeffrey Shorey became an Episcopalian as an adult. Her mother, she was raised as a Roman Catholic, and her mother actually became, I believe, Russian Orthodox. Mm -hmm. And so she came into the Episcopal Church from the Catholic world, bringing with her men, and she trained at a Roman Catholic seminary before taking a year at the Church Divinity School of the Pacific. So she came in with suppositions and understandings that this is how the church should work based on a Western slash Roman Catholic approach. And one of the things that she said was that, you know, the old guard is over. Now, the, probably the most within, now this is a silly thing to say, but the most famous in recent times pro, a proponent of the Philadelphia way was Frank Griswold. Frank Griswold was uh, the curate at the church where I was baptized. I wasn't baptized by him. <laughs> but, you know, we may joke about Frank Griswold's pluriformity and this and that and the other of not, you know, speaking, letting his yeas be yeas, his nays be nays. But that's not unique to Frank Griswold. That's the culture of Philadelphia. You know, it was, I, yeah, I agree. And, and also it was Mark Twain who said, I think it was in Boston, they ask, what do you know? In New York, they ask, how much are you worth? In Philadelphia, they ask who your parents were and who's your family. And we may go oh, snicker, snicker, ha ha, but that is still true in how we approach the world. So although I may come from the issues opposite to Frank Griswold, my understanding of how the games played is the same way as he understands it. And there's also this philosophy within the church that we're here to stay forever. There's never going to be a split. Um, we will go down with a ship, uh, whether it's in the Anglican Communion, whether it's in the Episcopal Church. Uh, I know bishops who think what happened with the ACNA uh, is a travesty, that, uh, they, that their splitting was done in you know, blatant sin and blatant disregard for the gospel and for uh, the church that was set forth uh, through Peter. And there's just that belief, and a lot of it comes from, well, in, in one case, this guy is clearly a, a far, far left Anglo-Catholic, but it's the way he was brought up in that, that Roman Catholic understanding of the structure of the church, mm -hmm. where my structure is a little bit more looser. I had uh, a family who jumped denominations quite frequently, and I didn't become an Episcopalian until 1989. Uh, when the church, in my opinion, was in complete free fall. And I said, hey, I'll, I'll, I'll sign on. So, you know, we, we, we come from different backgrounds and how we see the, the Episcopal Church, but we all need to agree that uh, the structures are broken enough that you can only rely on the prayer book of the Episcopal Church for resolution of what they truly think they believe. So, And see, I think people also should need to hear me say and Kevin say that we're not now talking about the underlying issues of abortion, homosexuality, mm -hmm. so on and so forth. We're talking about how we got here and how the personalities are at work so that you can understand. I get hate mail all the time from people saying, how could you remain in the Episcopal Church because it's going to hell and this and that. And usually there, or you anonymous comments, uh, on Facebook or on the websites. Well, my initial response is, well, why would you leave something that's working? Mm -hmm. And he said, well, what do you mean it's working? <laughs> it's working just fine for me. My church, uh, uh, my faith life, my congregation is entirely in line and, uh, with an, a, a certain way of Episcopal doing things. But I'm not a New Englander or a Southerner where, you know, I'm going to fight for an issue and, and until the whole thing goes down. I'm going to basically fight for personal holiness and for the holiness of people around me. That is my worldview. And we don't have a common Episcopal worldview. We certainly don't have a common Anglican worldview. Um, and part of my problem, many problems, with Justin Welby is that he is now trying to stamp a worldview on the communion 
that is the worst of crappy corporate culture with uh, English uh, Englishness. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Gavin no, no, is no, not here a, to defend this. Yeah, no, yeah. Well, defend the, himself. The, what are we talking about? Uh, Justin Welby invited a, a bunch of new bishops over to be inducted, their words, not ours, into the Anglican Communion. You will not believe, George, who one of those bishops was with no mention because his name didn't appear, just his face in the pictures. We we must give credit to the blog Anglican Samizda yeah. for pointing out that I believe it's Kevin Robertson, Bishop Robertson, the suffragan of Toronto, was one of these 30 bishops brought to Lambeth Palace to be trained and in, by the Anglican Consultative Council uh, office. And, and inducted. 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 Now, what is this? <laughs> now, usually you go to Cooperstown, New York, to be inducted into sure. the Hall of Fame. Unless you're Pete like Rose. That. Pete Rose won't be inducted. Now, Kevin, that, that's a sore spot for me. Okay. Uh, really? But we won't go there. <laughs> the, using the word inducted, using the word... Now, friends, there is no such thing as the Anglican Communion Office. How can I say that? Because we read about it all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's not because I'm brighter than you. No, I'm not that. John L. Peterson, former General S Secretary General of the Anglican Consultative Council, under George Carey, once printed up stationery calling his office the Anglican Communion Office. I remember it was sort of red, reddish stationery, red lettering. And George Carey said, you can't do this. You are not the Anglican Communion Office. You are the Secretary General of the Anglican Consultative Council. You cannot expand. You, you, you can't do this, George. You, okay. <laughs> I, you cannot expand your office and responsibility by printing up stationery. Well, time goes on. We have a new Archbishop and a new Secretary General, Kenneth Kieran. And Kieran resurrected the old title and began sort of a mission creep and responsibility creep. Now, he and Rowan Williams didn't really get on that well. And Williams had other things to do, <laughs> major things to do, and then sort of reign in Kevin K Kenneth Kieran. Now, remember we had the Lambeth Conference in uh, 2008, was it? Mm -hmm. Last one. And they forgot to uh, pay for the tent, uh, the big market tent. tent. Quarter million dollars. And in the investigation afterwards, the official report put out by a, a panel, they had a little footnote saying, now we use the word Anglican Communion Office with the full knowledge that there is no such legal entity. It's just the shorthand expression. It's akin to calling the National Church Episcopal Offices 815. There is no such thing as 815. There's the Domestic and Foreign Mission Society, the Episcopal Church at 815 Second Avenue. Under Adaiwa Ferron, who is the who is the agent, the tool of Justin Welby, we have two people working to one purpose, which is the centralization and consolidation of power, so that you have bishops come to Lambeth to be inducted into the Anglican Communion, when such a thing is abhorrent to the Anglican way of doing things. Not just because I'm from Philadelphia, but because <laughs> of our understanding of episcopacy. And the other thing I'd like to point out is, if if I were advising GAFCON, I would write to the 29 other bishops who went there saying, did you know that among your numbers, because there were no spouses, was the gay suffragan of Toronto? Are you happy that you were used as the fig leaf by Lambeth to normalize homosexually active bishops? Are you happy that you were used as a prop? Um, you, you, you see the group photo. It looks like a Coca-Cola commercial of people about to burst and I'd like to teach the world to sing. But instead, it was a prop. And part of that prop was the continued normalization of what was once considered sinful behavior by Justin Welby. Yeah, I don't think his name was left off by accident. You know, it, it's all part of this plan, you know. And the plan seems to be slowly working. Um, now, 
to build upon this, I see that Archbishop Oko has responded to what happened in Canada with a letter, and the, kind of the, the emphasis of the letter is what happened in Canada is going to have a horrible effect on Lamb of 2020, and if this is the way we're going to show the communion, um, it's going to be troublesome, uh, in my words. Now, I like the fact that he wrote a letter. It's a well-written letter, and it points out everything perfectly, but I don't think the tit-for-tat strategy of pointing things out is going to help build a coalition uh, within GAFCON and non-GAFCON people to fight what is happening at an international level, George. Yeah, let's, let's think about this. I mean, we need to distinguish the content, which was excellent. Uh, right. Archbishop Oko said that the Get Lambeth 2020 will be an obstacle to the gospel, mm -hmm. and he lays out why, and I, I believe that's a, he has a cogent argument. It, but it, the way it was presented means that someone like Greg Venables, who's going to Lambeth 2020, who's thoroughly on board with everything that Peter uh, that 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 uh, Nicholas Oko has said, you're basically casting him uh, into outer darkness. What are you going to do about Manir and Nice? What are you going to do about the what we call global the global south? south yeah. The the uh, south, the Archbishop uh, um, Moon of Southeast Asia. Where are the Burmese? Where are the south? Where is the Indian Ocean? Bishop People Love. who Bishop, Bishop uh, Love, your bishop. Uh, yeah. Now, in painting it so starkly, it doesn't give Archbishop Oko and the Gafka movement the ability to maneuver to win the fight they've chosen in other words they've they can win the battle on western grounds just as lambeth 98 the battle was won by conservatives for the africans got their act together for the first time even though it was a western environment they still won the day they found the microphone they found the microphone and they had people to help them understand this is how how parliamentary procedure works and this is how you you just don't have to take it well Lambeth 2008 they did away with parliamentary procedure and it was basically a, a pep rally 2020 we don't know what it's going to look like but th there is still power in numbers and I don't think it's a wise decision to denigrate those with whom you share common moral principles but have different views as to how to exercise those principles. That's George's opinion. No, I, I, and I, 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 I think the tit for tat strategy isn't going to work. If I were Archbishop Oko, I would have written a letter that that basically said, "Okay, you bishop from the Solomon Islands uh, who just went to the new bishop thing, are you comfortable in standing with Kevin Robertson? Are you comfortable?" Uh, this new bishop from Pakistan, are you comfortable having the Muslim Brotherhood or whatever group is in your country say, this is what Anglicanism stands for, you're arm in arm with a uh, partnered gay bishop? Um, married, not partnered. A married a gay bishop. Um, is this, in other words, oh, I wish they'd pick their shots better. I really do. We'll see what the future holds. There's a new gang coming in town, so uh, we'll, we'll see. George, we have hit, I'm not going to say how long, but, you know, you guys out there who listen to us, thank you so much. This is the music you get to listen to as we close out the program. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching Anchor Unscripted, episode 485.